like oh whatever do you want to get veronica mars tattooed across your chest you fucking do it dude yeah and then you have to like reevaluate almost everything like oh, i'm thinking of like movies i watched on dates right and and they felt more more special more important because i was more excited uh more on the edge of my seat because naturally i was like interested in someone while i was there it would not have the same effect if i was alone so like is there any such thing like i know there's no such thing as objectivity but is subjectivity really this fucking anarchic like it has to be it has to be uh i mean i guess that's why dynamic becoming is the only true way to engage with art because i think your experience with art should change every single time that you see it because every single time that you see it, you should not only be in a different situation, but almost fundamentally a different person based on the context of where you are. Engaging with art is fascinating. And I think critics, that's who should be talking about this. Because literally what we do is engage with art, is interact with it. So why the fuck haven't, like... I don't give a fuck what film is, you know? Like the conversation where it went last time. I don't give a fuck define art i don't give a fuck about defining art i care about how we interact with it um and then we should really just if we figure out how the fuck we're actually interacting with art what gives us that euphoria what gives us those revelations what repulses us so much what disinterests us so heavily is it context is it environment is it atmosphere is it the the narrative is it the sonic uh texturing of the piece like what is it like, we don't actually know. I don't give a fuck what a film is but by definition because it's how we interact with it that matters. But maybe we interact with everything in completely bizarre, uh, completely bizarre ways that I can't really um, keep track of. No, I want to talk about fucking how we engage with art, how we interact with it. And that's why I like talking about postmodern art so much because it interacts with the way that we're interacting with it. Because it knows. Because it knows. That's why I have trouble saying that like there's sincerity in film. Um, because there's so many moving parts in that lap and so many moving parts in the film itself, and there's even more in the way that we're watching it. Moving parts everywhere. The environment, ourselves, our moods, what we ate that day, how much sleep we got last night. So much. So much. It's so fucking crazy. <laughs> they really get down to it, man. Oh my god, I love it though. Love it. Love interacting with art. So important. Like I wish on that last stream I did about film is fucking dead that I mentioned that I that I, I re remember to bring up that I think that the art is kind of defined by the way that people engage with it. I was getting at it. If you watch that stream, Jane brought up like that children do this be uh, to their parents because they want like the next, I don't know, TikTok reel or whatever they're trying to swipe through and that's why i don't think tiktok is cinema ultimately because the way that i act out my interactions with cinema is by actually inhabiting the narrative where where i'm not in control truly I, i'm living out a pre-planned narrative whereas someone who interacts with tiktok it's so it's completely in control i mean it, it's manipulated so like you're not actually in control but you definitely feel like you do it's a different sort of interaction with art the way that you interact with media i think determines what the media is like i don't care that they're both filmed you know i don't care that they're both recorded visually i wouldn't call fucking ballet and comedy theater even though they both can take place on a stage sometimes you know like there's a lot about the ways that we interact with art that we just kind of ignore and the criticism is that final part of how we interact with art that's like important I don't know, there's a lot of interesting things about art and media that I, that I wish more people would talk about because, like, it brings to mind so many things, like, like streaming services, the way that we stream. Or, like, I was in the hospital, right? And it's all about the way we interact with art. I was in the hospital, and uh, they were playing, like, a Saw Marathon on the Sci-Fi channel. And it is wild. Like, the way that we view art, the way we view it can change our our, our perception of it. So, like, watching it there on a mor morphine drip, and it's these torture scenes have been slightly sanitized for television slightly and like not too much but like they're being cut 
by uh by by commercials for fucking Burger King and like Home Depot, and it adds like a whole new thing. Like when you see a guy get tortured with with a hammer, and then you see a Home Depot ad for screwdrivers and hammers and shit, it's like, oh my god, this is so weird. And then I talked to someone else who um who watches my channel. I was talking to her, and she was like, it's like watching like enough or like a lifetime watching the lifetime movie network or watching the movie enough with, with JLo. And then it's broken up by commercials for like these battered wife stories are broken up by commercials for, uh, cleaning products for like, like other like stuff that would be directed towards, um, housewives and stuff, cleaning products and boxed wine. It, it is such a bizarre experience, such a bizarre experience interacting with art that, that even just by, putting it on television it's not film anymore you're not watching a film when it's on television you are watching television like suddenly just by the format just by the way it's interacted with you are altering the art itself it's fucking incredible to think about and i was talking about streaming services earlier i don't think that streaming is the same as uh as film or television it's its third thing uh because i i pay attention to structure to to narrative sequences to to rhythm to rhyme to uh, to the way the timing to the way uh to the way things are structured and television has its own structure a clear act structure and so does film streaming has its own structure as well and it's the structure of streaming like when you watch a netflix or hulu show the the point is to keep you watching that title for the longest amount of time and they have a hard <laughs> they almost have a harder time doing that because there are no commercial breaks normally you know at least not with premium or like their their goal is to keep you on that platform for the longest amount of time that's not the same goal as as film you know television not not necessarily the same goal because television has like a seven act structure. How, however many commercials there were in a, in a television show, that's how many acts there were supposed to be. Like watch the mini series of it. It's almost the perfect television structure because each commercial break is a different kid in his flashback being we see him as a grown up. Like it's a perfect television structure. Uh, and that's how you know it's not film. It's a completely different structure that revolves around stuff that was unique to to the art, you know, like film doesn't have to worry about commercials, but streaming has to worry about watch time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That to me is so wild. Why aren't people... A streaming movie isn't a movie. It's something to keep you on watch time. It doesn't mean that the watch time's artless. I know that it sounds a bit heartless because we live in an algorithmic age. So it is maybe a little less passionate than your old film and television, but there's still artfulness there. I hope you guys understand what I'm thinking. It's stuff I'm thinking about that I haven't really thought through entirely. How I first knew and saw Joshua Jackson was in the Mighty Ducks movies from childhood. We were the five kids just stuck in detention all day. Yeah, at first they hate each other and then they become really, really good friends. Oh yeah, the movie stunk. Whatever happened to those actors? Well, Anthony Michael Hall got some kind of weird thyroid condition. Molly Ringwald lost her gawky ingenue appeal, and the rest are languishing somewhere in TV obscurity. No way! Emilio Estevez, he was in those duck movies, remember? God, those were classics. So funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually really funny. <laughs> It should be an emotional process because the viewer is the transformative quality of the media. We transform it into what, what it will ultimately become. We are the, the dynamic becoming component of the artistic process. We make it something special. We make it something new. We make it something borrowed, something blue. We make it something very interesting and cool. We're kind of keeping these these candles burning for these films that we really don't connect with. And it looks like it's like a legacy of us pretending that, that, that we've connected with something because we were told to, or because like, it's the smart thing to do when in actuality, fucking gossip girl is probably the greatest work of art ever made. Like the original run by Josh Schwartz and Stephanie Savage starring Leighton Meester. It's probably the greatest work of art ever made. I mean, and this is coming from someone who is very fucking well versed in in foreign art house cinema. Um, man, fuck the Criterion Collection sometimes. Fuck Kino Lorber. Fuck pretentious cinephiles. Um, they really don't know what they're talking about. They're entirely idiotic and stupid. And that that's not what transformed them. You cannot tell me that's what transformed them as a person. And that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in like what changed the viewer? Like what changed you? And don't you fucking dare tell me it was Juliet of the Spirits or Le Visitoire du Soir. Don't fucking tell me that bullshit.
Don't tell me it was fucking M. Tell me, <laughs> tell me the fucking show that you couldn't wait to see when you got home. Show me that VHS cassette or that DVD that you wore the fuck out when you were 12. Show me that. Show me that because that's actually what informed you. Not the shit that you watched when you were 20 trying to fuck the cute, cute art kid. The movies that transform them, they call guilty pleasures because they're ashamed of their connection. I think that like it goes back to this. Like if you really connect with something emotionally, it's scary, right? Like it, it's scary because you're being so vulnerable with the art that you're watching, with the show, with the film, with the video game you're playing, with the book that you're reading. You're, re you're being very vulnerable and, and you feel, you know, not invaded upon, but 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 you feel a little defenseless as you should when you really connect with something. Right. So like they'll call it a guilty pleasure because they don't actually want to admit how much it affected them because they'll feel so seen and they like feeling invisible under the weight of like the massive um, reputations that these more uh, beloved, universally beloved films have. That's oh, 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 let me get problematic. <laughs> let me get kind of controversial for a second. Remember, I did like a little rom-com arc as well. And the shows that I cover, let's let's be honest, they were. They were targeted towards women more than men, for sure. So I find this kind of like pissed off little cinephile attitude about me covering these shows that like aren't fucking um, agreed upon to be, I don't know, canonized by some cinephile elite. I find that shit low key misogynist. Like, and I look at their favorite movies and it's all the, it's all the same fucking philosophy just by different filmmakers. Like, I love, I love me some Coppola. I love me some Scorsese. You know, I love me some Bertolucci, but it's the same fucking philosophy in, 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 in five different shades. Like, th that's it. And you're telling me I can't have this, this, uh, I can't have a more feminine, more pop ideology in there. And we can have ironic masculine pop ideology in there. It's fucking bullshit, man. It's bullshit. Low key misogynist for real. Like, like I can talk about fucking Fellini all day, every day, but I bring up the OC and, and, and apparently I'm a sellout. Why I do what I do though, is because I think that those shows uh, and those films, but like the work of Kevin Williamson, Josh Schwartz, Stephanie Savage, I think those things are important, super important. And I don't think anyone's really taken them seriously. Like out of all the teen shows I've covered, I think the only one that's ever had like some sort of serious academic treatment is Buffy. You know, like for some reason, and it's fine. I love, I love Joss's work and stuff. But for some reason, Joss Whedon gets to be taken seriously by the academics, but no one else does. So I, I like to give these shows like, like serious consideration. And obviously, I'm covering stuff from the '90s and 2000s because that's what informed and shaped me. Because I'm a huge believer in the idea that the media you consume when you're at your most impressionable kind of informs where you'll go in life, like what you'll become, what you'll end up becoming. And I don't even know what I've become. And I hope that by analyzing and studying and engaging with the art of my youth, I can not only figure out who I am, but figure out why everyone my age seems to be trapped in some sort of postmodern nightmare, uh, like some sort of existential inertia that they can't get out of. And like, I think that by studying the, the, the popular media at the time, I can get there. I can get to that point. Music is felt in the soul. Well, that's the problem. I don't believe in a soul. <laughs> I don't believe in a soul in the ultra modern world. I love to talk about teen shows, teen dramas, teen horror movies because that's the, those that's my favorite genre. Those are my favorite things on the planet. I, I love spending time with those tropes, with those with those kinds of characters, with those archetypes, with those narratives, and I I, I do I do have a preference. I do love postmodern art. And every coming of age story is kind of postmodern in essence, considering that every coming of age story is a deconstruction of youth. That is how you reach maturity. So postmodernism is just within the essence of teen, um, teen media, teen art which I love, which I love. So like, that's why I'm so focused there. And like I covered earlier, I'm focused on nineties and two thousands because that's the stuff that informed me. And I would love to know myself and my um, generation a little bit better. I'm proud of my, I'm, I'm okay. Fuck it, dude. I'm proud of my work for the most part here. Um, but especially when it comes to the shows, really proud of um, Vampire Diaries videos and Dawson's Creek. Well, I guess Kevin Williamson, because he, he's behind both those shows. So I'm proud of my Kevin Williamson work. If I can say anything, I'm proud of that. I'm, pr I'm proud of every video I've ever made that has to do with something Kevin Williamson did. So hopefully that's my great contribution to the world of uh, film and television criticism is that I'm the best understander. <laughs>
of Kevin Williamson. What do you think of 60s surfer comedies in terms of the teen genre? I, I, I literally think nothing of it. I, I, what do you mean? Because I don't think that the teen genre became artful until um, John Hughes. I don't believe that whatsoever. I've covered Rebel Without a Cause and like... 400 blows before um those are like outliers and i don't think that they're actually engaging with the teen genre in quite the way that the 80s films did i don't i don't really think that the genre that i love started until um call fast times the fucking train that arrives at the station you know the lumiere brothers but you know call 16 candles the true first one teen films in the 60s compared to the 80s i don't think that they were really engaging with teens or at least like they had nothing to say i think like that almost meaningless filler I don't think the teen genre itself became inarguably artful until the Breakfast Club with the group therapy session scene. And after that point, teen films are allowed to be very complicated and, and very artful. I think before that, it's all building up to that. And um, that's the moment where everyone had to start taking the genre seriously, whether they wanted to or not. Um, 60s is just... Like... Not saying there's not good material out there, but it's not it's nowhere near the caliber that I'm I'm interested in. It took a long time for the teen genre genre to be um to be raised to the level of art. And it took someone like John Hughes and a perfect cast and a perfect situation to do it. But then like look how how quickly that genre came, like how fast, how fast the teen genre moved. You know, like if we look at Fast Times in like 1980 or 1981, that'd be like the first 80s teen movie compared to the very last one, right? 1989 with uh, Say Anything, Cameron Crowe's film. Look how far the genre came in, in a decade. Compare that to how far like Marvel came in a decade, right? Nowhere. Look at how far the teen genre came. How many things they're able to talk about and discuss and analyze and interpret and deconstruct and then build up and be in love with. How emotionally complicated and sophisticated they got visually, just from fast times to say anything. Wow. And, and it's beautiful using those two films as your markers because they're both Cameron Crowe. Because Cameron Crowe wrote Fast Times and then directed Say Anything. So it's almost like Cameron Crowe ushered in the 80s teen uh, film revolution and then put the final rose uh, in that bouquet. And it was a beautiful fucking rose too. And then the 90s... Oh my God, we got so sophisticated, but you know that. Chad Michael Murray should have been a superstar. You know, Chad Michael Murray and Bianca Lawson are the king and queen of teen drama, of teen television. Between the two of them, you get all of them. Hell, with Bianca Lawson alone, you get 90% of every teen drama that was ever made. And yet both of them, neither of them had very impressive film careers at all. Not saying they weren't in good films. Bianca Lawson had Bones. Chad Michael Murray had House of Wax. But those two should have been superstars based on what I was able to see from uh, from their television work. But no, they, they will forever be the king and queen of teen drama to me. Chad, Chad Michael Murray and Bianca Lawson. And also, holy fuck, God, my bisexual just blinking everywhere. Chad Michael Murray, Bianca Lawson doesn't get sexier than those two. Oh, my God, bro. Why weren't they superstars? That's so stupid. Why weren't they superstars? <laughs> You got me thinking about Jill and how I saw her as a dark reflection or doppelganger of Sydney. I looked into archetypes and realized she is a shadow archetype. I feel like I might have been... Was that what I was... Did you add to that? Did I say that in Scream 4 video? I don't remember the video. But that sounds totally logical. And like, okay, so if Kevin Williamson is like using... And Craven too, if they're using um, archetypes. Archetypes are within postmodern films for almost the purpose of being deconstructed and then reconstructed. It's so fucking cool, right? Oh my God. She's a great shadow archetype of, of Sydney, if you want to view it that way. We shouldn't get too Jungian with it though, right? Because um, because the immediacy of, of her... Uh... Okay, well, okay. Okay, we could get we could get young again. Work with me here, hard films. Um, a shadow archetype could could you argue? I would argue that a shadow archetype is 
constantly deconstructing the primary archetype. Like, just by virtue of being the shadow archetype, it is constantly deconstructing the primary archetype. It has to be, right? Because it's taking everything about it, rearranging it, reformatting it, and um, weaponizing it, vilifying it. You know, I think that that's awesome. So, yeah. So we don't have to worry about getting too young again. It's just I don't think anyone's ever associated shadow archetypes with being like a perpetual deconstruction of the primary archetype. But I think that that's exactly what a shadow archetype ought to be. Yeah, Michelle Williams is friends with Britney Spears. <laughs> She's a, I don't blame her. I'd be friends with Britney Spears too if I had an option. In your last stream, I think you, um, you're asking about like what's Jill's lineage or legacy. In your original video, you talked about final girls, and Jill is a final girl. She's like the end result of the lineage. Okay, interesting. Interesting. I wish I remember that original video so much. It sounds interesting for me. And, and you're talking about shadow archetypes, which makes sense. I like yours a little bit more, by the way. But, but, but it would hinge on the idea that... Um, of final girls and that's what blew my mind about her uh when i saw it when it first came out the, the lineage of final girls yeah yeah okay okay awesome awesome but i like your shadow archetype thing but it hinges on the idea that a shadow arc and we'd have to rewrite jungian psychology <laughs> which is fun fuck carl Jung. we'd have to rewrite it in order to make it just purely postmodern in the sense that the shadow archetype is a constant deconstruction of the primary archetype in real time that you that you can't outrun and that will eventually overtake you. 